Today we're going to be looking at The Death of the Hired Man by Robert Frost and we'll start off with what happens in the poem. So Mary is waiting for her husband, Warren, who is a small farm owner. She tells him that an ex-employee of theirs, Silas, has returned. Silas is an old man who used to help them with the haymaking, but he repeatedly left the farm when Warren needed him most. Mary expects Warren to be angry at Silas's return, and he is. He says he told Silas last time he left that he wouldn't be able to come back again, and he intends to stick by his word. Mary informs him that Silas is very ill and miserable, but he is offering to help Warren out with the farm again. He would also like to work alongside a young schoolboy, Harold, whom he used to mentor despite the fact that they fought all through July. Apparently, he wants to save his self-respect and be some good, perhaps, to someone in the world. Mary adds that Silas will not be much trouble because he has come home to die. And her and Warren start discussing what home means. Warren bitterly says it's somewhere where people are obliged to take care of each other, even when they don't want to or inconveniences them. But Mary puts forth more peacefully that it's a place of love, which you don't have to earn. Warren complains that Silas should have gone to his rich brother for a home. Mary replies that he probably has a difficult relationship with his brother, as Silas is a difficult person to be around, and Silas would feel ashamed if he had to ask him for help. Warren begins to be convinced that Silas deserves their kindness, saying Silas isn't so bad, he never purposely hurt anyone. Mary reminds Warren of Silas's weak condition and implores him to have pity on him. Warren leaves, but comes back very soon, telling Mary that he found Silas dead. That is the literal narrative of the poem, but there are a lot of metaphorical and interpretive things going on under the surface, which we're going to be exploring in this video. Next, we'll go through the poem line by line. So we'll start with the title, The Death of the Hired Man. This is important because it means that we know from the off that this is leading up to Silas's death. And that adds a lot of suspense and a lot of doom to all of Warren's complaints about him. And the fact that he is convinced to forgive Silas and help him is more poignant because we already know that it'll be too late. Moving on to stanza one, we're just going to look at a couple of noteworthy quotes. I'm not going to read through the entire stanza like I usually do because that would just take far too long. So let's get on with it. Mary sat musing on the lamp flame. The lamp flame could be a symbol for Silas, which of course she is currently pondering. Put him on his guard. Be kind. This shows that Mary expects Warren to be oppositional about Silas's return, but it tells us that she is warm towards him. She took the market things down from Warren's arms and set them on the porch, then drew him down to sit beside her on the wooden steps. This immediately establishes the moral positions of Warren and Mary. So Warren's perspective of exchange and earning what you get is symbolized by the market things, whereas Mary's perspective of kindness and emotion is symbolized by her disregard of possessions in order to be close to her husband. Now looking at stanzas two to four. When was I ever anything but kind to him? But I'll not have the fellow back. This demonstrates Warren's different idea of kindness to Mary. He is nice to Silas, but his breaking of their contract makes him unworthy of kindness in Warren's eyes. He goes on to tell the story of how Silas betrayed his trust, and this relates to the conflict of farm labour employment modes prevalent in Frost's time. So on one side, there was the small traditional farmer, represented by Warren, who offered labourers a room for the year. Then at the end of the harvest season, they paid them their back wages. Emerging on the other side was larger farms, which employed workers for only two or three months during the harvest season. But the upside of that was that they paid them immediately. Small farmers could take advantage of the fact that in the winter, farmhands had nowhere to go in order to guarantee their employment in the busy months. However, Silas betrayed this agreement by being tempted by the instant pocket money of bigger farms. Apparently, he always does this. Now we see him coming back to Warren once again in disgrace, as his risk did not pay off. 
Warren says he wouldn't have minded Silas leaving if he was bettering himself, which means investing his earnings to start his own farm. But now he sees that Silas is just trying to leech help off Warren and Mary without paying them back for it. Warren also doesn't want to help him because there's little he can do due to his age. However, evidently he was useful enough to be employed by somebody else, and Warren later admits that he is good at organising the haystacks. So this is probably just Warren trying to argue his case and it hints at the fact that his argument is weaker because he's basically having to make stuff up in order to make his point. In stanzas five to nine, Mary relates the story of how Silas arrived huddled, miserable and frightening. This makes him sound like an animal, especially as he arrived at the barn door, not at the front door to the house. And this makes him sound very powerless and pathetic, I think, and I think that enlists sympathy from the audience. Then in stanzas 11 to 17, Mary describes Silas's motivations for returning. He apparently wants to save his self-respect by helping out on the farm. He also wants to work again with a college boy, Harold, despite the fact that, that they fought all through July. He thinks Harold is daft on education and the fool of books, and he wants to teach him farming practices. Warren admits that Silas does that well, which is his one accomplishment. Silas thinks by teaching this to Harold, he'd be some good perhaps to someone in the world. This sounds really desperate and forlorn, and again, I think it makes us pity Silas. However, we also can't help relating to Warren at this point as well, I think, in the fact that he's quite annoyed at Silas, because he clearly doesn't have respect for Harold and Harold's life choices. Um, but Mary doesn't think this way. She instead sympathizes with Silas's regret that he didn't make his point better. She says, I know just how it feels to think of the right thing to say too late. She sees him poking into other people's business as a consequence of his lack of pride or hope and describes him as poor Silas. So we can see we're getting some conflicting opinions on how to view Silas right now. In stanza 18, we take a break from the dialogue for a description of the moon. The moon could be a metaphor for Warren, and as it descends in the sky and its light poured softly in her lap, Warren's defiance is pulled down from its lofty position and comes down to earth towards Mary's humble generosity. She is tapping into his humility like it's a beautiful harp, which she played unheard. The beauty of her simple kindness is portrayed in this lyrical stanza. At the end of stanza 18, Mary says that Silas will not be much trouble this time because he has come home to die. Warren tries to mock her description of them as Silas's home, but he can only summon the anger to do this gently. So we can see how he's already starting to be convinced. He bitterly describes home as somewhere where people are forced to take care of one another, even if they don't want to or it inconveniences them. Mary more lovingly describes it as a sanctuary of love, which you don't have to earn. In stanzas 23 to 31, Warren picks up a stick and hopelessly breaks it in two, which signifies the oppositional and violent side of him relenting, perhaps going out in one last spark. He argues that Silas should have gone to his rich brother if he was looking for a home, and Mary appeals to him to have some pity on Silas. She describes, as we saw before, how he probably has a difficult relationship with his brother, and he would feel ashamed if he had to go to him for help. Warren begins to admit that Silas perhaps does not deserve scorn, saying Silas isn't so bad, he never purposely hurt anyone. He even uses a shortening of Silas's name here, just Sai, so that shows that his affection for the old man is starting to show through. Finally, in stanzas 31 to 36, Mary reminds Warren of the weak state that Silas is in. He's broken. She convinces Warren to go in and see him while she waits and watches the moon, which represents Warren's sympathy. A cloud obscures it, signifying that his mercy came too late. Warren comes back and informs Mary that Silas is dead. Okay, now we're going to look at the characters to try and break down what this whole thing is trying to say. So first of all, Silas. And I think that we are persuaded in the poem to look at Silas 
with both scorn and sympathy. So let's break this down a little bit. On the scorn side, he sticks by his prejudice against education and his brother, which doesn't come across as a very nice trait. And he also, of course, keeps abandoning Warren selfishly, then asking for his help once again. However, there are a lot more reasons to be sympathetic to Silas. Clearly, he's very weak, he's broken, says Mary, and he has come home to die. He is also described as miserable, huddled, frightened, and comes to the barn door like an animal. He's lost all his dignity and all his chances at respect, and he is now devoid of pride and hope. He has also never given his own voice in the poem, representing the powerlessness of farm workers. He came to die at the closest thing he had to a home, his workers' house. And this shows how he can't even rely on his own family. And it's just sad, the fact that the closest thing he has to a home is this place he went to work. Silas desperately wants to be some good, perhaps, to someone in the world. And he is ashamed to go to his brother. He is just trying to save his self-respect. And his past troubles him like a dream. Showing how broken and regretful his spirit is, not merely his body. Also, his reluctance to go to his brother for help or to set up his own farm could be interpreted as a desire for freedom, not dependence, which relates to the classic American dream, which many, many people reading the poem would be able to relate to. So I think these contradictions about Silas make him more complex. Frost intends or expects us to relate to Warren more than Mary. First of all, we'll respond to Silas with scorn and then... As Warren is convinced to be merciful throughout the poem, hopefully the reader is persuaded to be more pitiful towards him too. Looking at Silas's death, I think it is given a lot of weight in the poem in various ways. So he possibly committed suicide as he was sitting beside the stove and he could have gassed himself with that. That makes his plight more dramatic and hard hitting in my opinion. He had no purpose and no path to go down so he gave up and took his own life which is obviously really really tragic and Warren's blunt revelation of his death highlights the unromantic tragedy of this death whether it was suicide or not and how his mercy came too late there's really nothing like beautiful or romantic about this poem it's just sad and horrible really it's also tragic because Silas came to the farm reportedly to find meaning again. He wanted to help out those he had wronged, Mary and Warren, and he wanted to make up with Harold and try and help him. But neither of those was fulfilled. Silas's death also adds weight to Mary and Warren's conversation because we know that it's leading up to his death and he's actually off stage dying as it takes place. So it's got this really morbid undertone. I think that the message of his death is to show how important mercy is. Because although Warren is convinced to be merciful, it came too late. So it really shows us how important it is to always be merciful. Because if it comes too late or if we don't do it right, then it can lead to tragedy. A lot of what we need to know about Mary's character comes from her name it's probably a reference to the biblical Mary, the mother of Jesus Christ, who was also a merciful mother who prays for and serves sinners. And thus, she's pretty much the perfect parallel with this Mary's pure matriarchal values. Mary's mercy is described with beautiful diction such as tenderness, harp and softly. However, there is an irony in her position because if Silas hadn't died, his care would probably have fallen to her, just as was shown in the poem. This is an example of how women tend to advocate matriarchal values of compassion over service, but in this patriarchal world, this translates ultimately to unpaid service. She says that home is something you don't have to deserve, but in the end, she would have had to serve the undeserving. And I think that she sympathizes with Silas's pathetic brokenness, in part because of this, the way that she is squashed by the system and made inferior, and how her situation isn't fair, just as the situation of farmhands at the time was not fair. Then there is Warren, who represents the small humble farmer, 
And he is also the perspective that we are supposed to relate to in the poem. He is definitely not the villain of the story because he is shown to be kind. He always lets Silas stay in the past and he is convinced of the compassionate path to go down. Had he seen Silas, he probably would have had more mercy. So I think the real tragedy of the story is not in a hateful and mean person. It's just that the situation and the social positions of the characters came together to create a very sad event. Really interesting to look at in terms of characters for me is the contrast between the different characters. So Silas contrasts with his brother who is rich and successful and also with Harold who is young and educated. Silas scorns these people because he can't possibly stand up against them and we feel sympathy for his inferior position. Silas is also represented by the lamp flame which will go out eventually just as Silas is close to death. Whereas Warren is represented by the moon, which is bright and powerful and eternal. And Mary is tender to both of these. Mary's leading principle is that no external reason is needed to love and care for a person. It's their birthright to be treated with compassion. Warren's principle, which he is convinced to let go of by the end of the poem, is to be kind to people as long as they're kind back, as long as they deserve it. Warren's position is shown to be wrong by the fact that he's lingering on Silas's past wrongs, whereas Mary is concerned with his current plight. Gestures also serve to show how the characters feel. Silas is slumped and pathetic and effectively invisible because he never appears in the poem, representing his hopelessness and powerlessness. Warren is aggressive and uncertain, breaking a twig, whereas Mary is open and in control, She takes the market things and knows where to put them, and she holds the power of the moon in her lap. The main theme that this poem explores, in my opinion, is home and deserving. So the plight of Silas is made universally poignant by its relevance to the discussion of home and belonging unconditionally. Mary and Warren's debate about whether to take him in is really asking the question, Should anyone ever be rejected from love and mercy? This is typical Robert Frost because he's turning an ordinary rural conversation into a philosophical debate. And I think that the underlying message of the whole exploration of home is the opinion that ends up winning out Mary's perspective. Mary thinks that home transcends the calculated system of exchange and reward and therefore is a place where people don't have to deserve love. They just have it by birthright. So from this, we can move into looking at the general moral of the poem. As I said, Mary's is shown to be the superior argument of the debate because of her control of nature. She has moonlight in her lap, whereas Warren breaks a twig. Her superior knowledge of Silas's situation, her focusing on the present where Warren focuses on the past, and her knowledge of everything Warren is about to say. For example, she knows that he's going to be angry, and she warns him not to. Warren is convinced of Mary's argument along with the reader. Therefore, the moral is to prioritise matriarchal values over patriarchal ones. And this can be phrased in a lot of different ways, so I'm just going to throw these at you. Relationships over economy, mercy over justice, feeling over thinking, emotions over reason, need over exchange, humanity over numbers. Yeah. (laughs) Not only this, but Frost puts this debate in the context of modern farming practices and how those have led to Silas being broken and worthless. Whereas with Mary and Warren on the traditional farm, he feels at home. The poem is thus also saying that modernization leads to rejecting the home and feminine ethics such as kindness and trust. And I think this definitely goes with what Frost often writes about. He is very anti-modernism. Finally, I want to point out some of the ways that all these messages are portrayed through the form of the poem. So this poem is written in blank verse with realistic dialogue. This helps to distinguish Mary and Warren's different perspectives. 
Silas, on the other hand, is voiceless and therefore kind of pathetic and invisible. There's also gestures which show the character's feelings. Mary is very open and in control, as we've seen, and Warren is sort of violent and desperate. There is beautiful diction, which shows Mary's purity in her viewpoint, and there is also the divine matriarch connotations of her name. 